Had I not been the fierce anti-communist I was, Good evening and welcome. The presentation you're about to see was first shown at the Nine Worlds Geek Fest on Saturday, the 9th of August, 2014. It has since undergone some small alteration. Thank you for coming here this evening to Gosh Comics, who we thank for hosting this event. Now, if you'll all remain in your seats, and please stay closed during the event. Thank you. <laughs> a man stands in front of the world. The images blur into one another, a wall of screens. He sits watching, looking for meaning. He sits watching, looking for the future. Eventually understands, and he sees what he's going to do about it. Watchmen. This is a speech on Watchmen, which is a book I suspect most of you have heard of. I also suspect it's a book I hope most of you have read, because I'm kind of spoiling it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to spoil it so badly, it's not even, even returning. How for the point of just the speech, I'll do a very brief synopsis is that it is a revisionist superhero comic, published in 1985, I believe. <laughs> Fact-checking. Um, <laughs> published in 1985, and it basically is stories across 50 years of history uh, about a group of superhumans, only one of which is actually genuinely what we would define as superhuman. It is a murder mystery. It involves a character called the comedian being killed in the first episode, and them actually trying to work out who killed him. It's really not about that. <laughs> Uh, spoilers, Ozzy Mandias did it. <laughs> it is about a lot of stuff. Its form is fundamentally that of character portraits, uh, building towards revelation. So this is going to be about Watchmen's, it's also going to be about mine. There's going to be a bit of autobiographical nonsense at the start, which, but honestly, we'll get back to formalism and nine panel grids in time. Okay, autobiography stuff, go. I never read comics as a kid. Um, I said that all the times in interviews and... It's never true. It's kind of a shorthand. I do that to basically skip to the interesting stuff. In actual fact, I uh, read comics as a kid as much as anybody who reads comics. If it was possible to get to twos, I would have got to twos of that, for example. When I say that, what I'm really trying to say is I'm not a lifer, in terms of I'm not somebody who grew up in comic culture and went to comic shops from an early age to now. I'm somebody who left it and ended up coming back. You know, I've read my brother's 2000 ADs. That was a good noise. Oh dear. Actually, the idea of actually a Brendan McCarthy Strange Days thing falling in my head would be amazing. It's like that, that's actually a metaphor. I, I, I really like that. Basically, I read all that kind of stuff. Basically, what was available. Um, but there was no comic stock shop in Stafford when I was a teen. And when actually sort of writing this, I had the thought that basically most of the people in this room will probably have a comic shop on their phone, which is kind of progress if you squint, which is probably worth remembering. Anyway, I knew what Watchmen was. Uh, I knew it because it was a comic of note, and it was a comic of note because it was discussed in places like the games magazines and music magazines and all the rest I was obsessed with. It's sort of like I knew it was something I should have an opinion on, even though I didn't have one. <laughs> I wouldn't have for some time. At the cusp of 21, I actually ended up going to America. I did a degree, and I was basically going to research uh, schizophrenia by dissecting human brains. Uh, so I had to basically get a visa. I went to that building. I turned up to there thinking of booze and discovered it didn't open for four hours. And so I was basically dropped in London and with nothing to do and trying to work, what the hell? So I go to the Virgin Megastore uh, on Oxford Street, I think it was at the time. Uh, I, look, I look over to anybody who might know. Uh, so I go there and try to wander around and not look like a shoplifter. And there I see, for the first time in my life, an actual physical copy of Watchmen. I buy it. I go into actually the McDonald's on Oxford Street and read it. And I read it from cover to cover in three hours. And it was weird. As I, I flicked forward and saw the end of Rorschach, and therefore I understood it as a concept of a tragedy, I, this person is going to die. And that kind of altered things, but it still was fundamental. And it was transformative. And the person who left that place, slightly caffeinated from these really, really bad McDonald's uh, teas, uh, was a fundamentally different person than the person who walked in. Anyway, I got my visa and went to live in America. Not that one. Uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was awful, not Miss America, she's amazing. Uh, it was awful in a kind of really tedious way. I've kind of had worse years in my life, but at least they had entertainment value. Uh, this was long and tedious. It was very much a year when I spent mocking off every day on the calendar, like in a very literal way like that. 
I didn't have a television for like the first month. I only brought with me two things, which were basically a big stack of existentialist philosophy texts and Watchmen. <laughs> uh, and I read Watchmen so many times in the first month because I was basically too depressed to read anything else. And that kind of says something, I guess. And it, that's why my original copy of Watchmen is kind of like this, which is an exciting, like, individual leaf structure. Existentialist texts evidenced here. Now, I read that Watchmen so many times, and it kind of, that's all I had to read. That's when I kind of started really obsessing over it. That's kind of what led to this lecture. So I, the more I read it, the more I saw, and the more I saw, I more understood. And this happens all the way through. Anytime I reread Watchmen, I notice something else. And kind of like, the weirdest thing is the actual, what this presentation ends up being about is about something new I got from reading Watchmen the last time. And I genuinely have no idea how many times I've read this book. Uh, it's made to transform you as Watchmen. And it's made to transform you better able to understand it and thus understand comics. And I kind of think back to the actual day as a creator when I started seeing flaws in Watchmen. I think that was an enormous important moment for me both as a human being and as a creator. The idea that you know, I have, it's taught me enough to be able to see the actual problems with the card trick, if you will. Okay, I mentioned the not reading comics as a kid thing. That's one part of the autobiography I always do. And that's, that's the cheat. The other cheat is that I read like a couple of trades a year until from 21 to 25, and then I got to comics properly. Uh, what I know, that's not really true. What really was true is that uh, at the age of 25, I got into comics. At the age of 21, I got into Watchmen. I genuinely can't understate how important the book is to me. Look at it, Watchmen. This is John Brown. John Brown used to run a comic shop, The Live Among Us, in, um, I've completely what part of London that's in. Richmond, thank you very much. Uh, and I was in the pub like a year and a half ago with him, and he said, you know, he's, he owned a shop for like 20 years, and he said, what's the big deal about Watchmen? And I said, I'll do a speech to explain it, because it, for me it was a big deal, and it annoyed me if he didn't get it. This isn't that speech. <laughs> uh, Watchmen really is just too big. When, we, when I found myself researching this, I ended up not wanting to do actually a speech. I wanted to do a course. I wanted to sit down with you like five, six, twenty-four uh, times and just break the fucker down. Instead, I'm just going to hang on one theory. I want to focus on specifically one part of a larger design. Watchmen transform comics. See this? Now see this. With that piece of controlled violence, every vigilante comic in comics warped. And this isn't like Miracle Man, which uh, bred surrealism from a god gone mad, whose Caligulian excesses got to warp reality. This is very simple. This is simply this to this. That very simple action basically begat everything we consider grim and gritty. The idea that every second rate vigilante can be made more credible by this application of force. It's the sort of comic that read realistic as awful. This is a trend that uh, Morrison in Flex Mentalo skewered. Only a bitter little adolescent boy could confuse realism with pessimism. It's not what I'm going to be talking about. <sighs> Watchmen is also to our modern eyes problematic in about a half dozen ways. I'll probably manage an apology for the about a half dozen and, and agree with some of the rest. I could do it, but it kind of feels irrelevant. My standard position in art. If this isn't Cain, in terms of actual content, was equivalent to a birth of a nation. Imagine that. You're a director working in the period. You could choose to engage with it, look at it and take from it. But you, know, you could choose to not do any of that as well. But to do the latter only leaves your art worse. An art that cannot move people as effectively loses the war. Take the techniques, techniques which make it a masterwork and use it for changing the world. Your purity only hurts the reason you're doing it. Do you want to feel self-righteous or do you want to win? I like to win. The point is to change the world. So is a machine that, that kills fascists. Story is a machine that kills whatever you want it to. Be afraid of story, be afraid of storytellers. They are only trying to lie to you. Watchmen is a novel. It's thematically dense in a way which is somewhat overwhelming. When researching this, I kept on wanting to do a talk of character through lines. I mean, the story is structured around character origins. Ergo, that's a very natural way to look at Watchmen. Uh, how everything delineates against one another. You know, Rorschach as classic tragical hero. Is that would be a very obvious reading of Watchmen. Oh. Classic tragic hero. Inevitably, I'm going to do some of it, uh, but that's not the core. A literary analysis of Watchmen is fascinating, and as a book, it's 100% worth doing. But it's also 100% worth doing to any one of a million other novels. Any novel which has anything worth talking about, you could do that too. Fundamentally, this is what Watchmen does, which a novel can't. It's what a comic is about, what a comic can do, 
and what you should know as a reader and possibly a creator so you can both appreciate it and use it better. And it's kind of like what I take from Watchmen in many ways. This is about Watchmen's comics. As Harvey Pekar put it famously, comics are just words and pictures. You can do anything with words and pictures. Uh, this is one of the anythings. Okay, that was the aim. I stumbled a bit and now it's more about... <sighs> Watchmen is a philosophical statement of how you should be able to read comics, or at least one way of reading comics. Uh, there's a quote from Alan's writing, which is around the period, which is collected in Alan Moore's writing about comics. It's kind of uh, about the, what, the draftsman's contract, a film of the period. And basically he kind of argues that the problem, if anything, he hasn't actually seen the draftsman contract when writing this quote. But he says, reading reviews, it was like, this is thematical and literary and beautiful, but I can't make a sense of it, and I can only make sense of it having watched it like three or four times. As in the point being, you meant to sit and absorb it. Uh, you know, as in you meant to rewatch it, but that doesn't really work with film because you don't really control it. The same way he talked about him reading Gravity's Rainbow, and he could have read Gravity's Rainbow in six hours, you know, at his current reading speed, but he understood that Gravity's Rainbow was meant to be written and considered as a whole, and so he read it like over a like, period of months. But for that, you know, as a novel, by definition, you lose a lot of things. He came to the idea that it occurred to me that, uh, sorry, I, I want to try to do an Alan Moore voice, but I'll be so bad at it. <laughs> it occurred to me uh, a comic strip version of the Draftman contract would have in many ways the best of both worlds. Given sufficient intelligence on the part of the creators involved, there's no reason why the comic strip work shouldn't have all the depth and complexity of the book and the visual flow and appeal of the film. At the same time, to be read and appreciated at whatever pace the reader finds most appropriate. In terms of intellectual and emotional effect on the reader, it seems to represent an edge that comics would do well to exploit. In the end, it's the effect which governs the success of an individual piece of artwork or the whole art form. While abstract critical considerations concerning the inherent quality of work may give us a few useful handles which to grasp and appreciate a work more fully, art still succeeds or fails in terms of the actual effect it has upon the individual members of the audience. If it stimulates and excites them, they will respond to it. If it doesn't, they'll go and look for something that does. Comics have a capacity for effect they haven't begun to take advantage of, and they are held back by narrow and increasingly obsolete notions of what constitutes a comic story. In order for comics to move forward with a medium, these notions must change. Well, I kind of guess that's what Watchmen is. You know, it's a, a, a demand that the medium change. It's too complicated to get in one go, but every part is clockwork. It's made to be reread and reread and reread. It's a structural masterpiece. I suspect that's kind of what put me off from actually writing this for about a whole year. You know, I kind of really genuinely did put it off. To write a Watchman is just basically trying to do Watchmen, and that's going to always be a failure. So when I was sitting in the hotel lobby the night before Nine Worlds with literally nothing written, I was basically tapping away drunkenly, and I got as far as introduction based on Ozymandias, nine panel grid, my own entrance into comics, depression, and I gave up. <laughs> in so many ways. Okay, you may know stuff skip the nine panel grid, let's show it. Watch that, there. Remember this. If we're talking about the many icons of Watchmen, this is the invisible one. It underlines everything. You to went to watch these little boxes, hundreds of them, and make sense by combining them all into a larger piece of meaning. Watch. Watchmen. That's the basic point is to be able to actually read the fucker. It's possible you may not believe comics are meant to be structured like this. I mean, let's just take the title, written on the cover in that actually incredibly unique at the time way. Simon Spurrier, uh, he really hates title drops. Uh, in terms of he finds they break stories. This is it's distractful, it's artificial. I kind of disagree. Uh, this is art and as such artifice, and it kind of depends on the effect. Titles can haunt to work like a ghost. The title can tick, tick, tick away. Which brings me to watch imagery, I guess. Obviously, the title is from a quote, which only appears in the back of the trade. I'm not even going to try to do the Latin. It's the Chris Custodes Ipas Custodes, as in who watches the Watchman. You may note it appears in the book all the way through it. Fundamentally, it is never seen complete in the book. Every time you see uh, who watches the Watchman, it is never completed. I, we only see the quote outside the context of the story. We have to complete it ourselves, which is a key idea. And you have to piece together the larger appearance of it to put the full story, which is the other key idea. Okay, 
12 chapters. Once again, uh, we're talking about uh, watch imagery, the, the 12 hours uh, on the clock face. Uh, the 12 episodes, as I mentioned late, I'll mention later, but um, it also happens across 12 weeks, is Watchmen's, which you won't realise until you actually do the maths on it. 12 hours of the clock face, it's called The Watchmen. You may notice the characters are not The Watchmen. They're never any, any point, they're not The Watchmen. They're The Minutemen, and possibly The Crime Busters later. Uh, the Minutemen obviously has a verbal connection uh, to the Watchmen. I said Watchmen, Minutemen. Minutemen being smaller than the whole. Uh, of course, it's also the implication, you know, they make the, the sexual jokes about their, like, how long we last in bed. And, you know, there's obviously a historical reference to it, the American militia and the War of Independence, which kind of links something outside the book, uh, which says something else. Watchmen is culturally literate. It assumes the audience is educated, or at least willing to educate themselves. It does a lot to encourage it. Watchmen, I'm arguing, is a challenge for us all to actually ra raise to its level. And the idea that we, the, the work does not have to pander to the reader. You know, the reader can attempt to improve himself to engage with the work. Of course, the tragedy of what was mostly taken from Watchmen is... Anyway, the actual title drop appears right towards the end. When uh, actual Osman Dyer actually quotes the actual line, we're the watchmen on the world of freedom. A couple of panels later, we get this quote uh, when he quotes from Hitler. Uh, the actual, the riffing from JFK to Hitler is, uh, you know, obviously important. I'm going to click this and see what happens next. On the left, we have the Hiroshima watch. Uh, for, okay, we're all going to die. Immediately, they're juxtaposing the concept of watch with the concept of time running out. Time running out is very important. This appears all the way through the trade, where we see the clocks ticking closer to midnight. And then we go to this. The blood starting to drip in, clocking midnight. I went to the end. The final issue's cover is, of course, this. And we actually see the actual clock close to midnight. So the, the whole book is about the approaching doom. Then, of course, there's the other visual icon of Watchmen, which is probably easier one to miss. There's this. Which, of course, is this. Uh, at some level, this smear of blood on the actual smiley face and the juxtaposition between the, uh, the, the comic uh, fakeness and the reality of the pure flesh and blood. It's also like the handle of the watch, so in other words, that positioning. And then of course there's this, which is where we see that shape again. And this, 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 and this. And there's a lot more. Is there another one? Let's carry on here. <laughs> um, you know, it's always, it's always a couple of seconds to midnight. And then, of course, we get to the punchline, which is one of the most famous punchlines in modern comics. It doesn't matter, the time had already ran out. It, it's too late, it's always too late. Which works in the concept of the story, but there is a larger point. Let's go back to one of the most acclaimed chapters in the book. Uh, we are talking about Watchmaker. Uh, Watchmaker is based around the idea of Dr. Manhattan. The idea is outside time. We see it from his perspective. The past and the future have already all happened. He's the most powerful individual in the story, and he's fundamentally powerless. He's as trapped as everybody else. Uh, everything happens simultaneously. Now, you know, this is reality as holograms. This is a, sol this is a, you know, a solid block of time. This is not an unusual idea. Uh, the actual name for this, as pointed out by one Ed Fortune after my first speech, is eternalism the philosophical concept of eternalism. Every, everything has already happened. Everything has happened simultaneously. It's already too late. Basically, that's what Watchmen is. Yes, it happened 35 minutes ago, but it's literally all there in front of you. There was nothing you could do about it. Everything these characters are, or ever will be, happens in these pages. There is nothing else in the Watchmen universe apart from this. No matter what anyone else tells you, this, and only this, is Watchmen. <laughs> if you wanted to take one meaning from Watchmen, I'll say the story is a story of how people are constructed and made, what makes these people what they are. This is a story that takes place over 12 weeks. The history goes past decades. These are clockwork people. This is the clockwork story, when even the most powerful are powerless. You know, you basically, all the characters get chapters. It, it, you basically go through the major cast and you see how each one is put together. You get the Rorschach character. What made Rorschach Rorschach? What made, what, what made Dr. Manhattan Dr. Manhattan? What made the comedian a comedian? What made Laurie Laurie? Weirdly, I say Laurie Robinson Silk Spectre, which probably says something about Laurie, at least my relationship with her. Anyway, as my hand puts at the end of his, who makes the world? Watchman's ending is famous. 
it leaves it hanging. This is, you know, it's how they end it. You know, the, mo the most stupid character in the entire plot, given the position of deciding the fate of the plan of the smartest, which is a structural irony. The question becomes, is it possible to know what happens next? Now, there's basically three options. My good friend Sarah Gordon, who lives like within 200 metres of this place, weirdly, jokes about doing an extra page to Watchmen and just stick it in the back of every copy, and that would be this page. <laughs> <laughs> I stress I drew that rather than Sarah. Sarah's really good. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, the joke is that that's not the ending. And, that, and the fact that this is entirely like, against the spirit of the book is why this is abstractly funny. But I really like me trying to do the blood smear, except I've done it on the wrong side. <laughs> I am the worst. Um, okay, there's three ways you can read the ending. Either Ozymandias' scheme is uncovered, or it's not covered, or we simply cannot say for sure. Uh, for me, there is absolutely no evidence in the text that you can say it is not uncovered. I think the, uh, we cannot truly say, you can make an argument for, but I think there's not much evidence for it. I think the first is foreshadowed throughout and the only acceptable way that you can read it. And I, you know, I've yet to see anybody ever argue against it to any way I would find convincing. The most obvious element that foreshadows is the fact that the ending is a bad one. Well, you know, define bad. Uh, is the pirate story where a man riding a boat of dead people tries to save his family from a dark ship threatening it only ends up killing innocent people and dooming himself. The black ship was only coming for him. Even during halfway through the story, he wrestles with a palsy yellow and mottled shark. <laughs> you know, a, a, literally a raw shark flesh uh, as referenced explicitly in a story by the chef's later. I.e. he fights raw shack. You know, this is, isn't exactly subtle, which is kind of the point. And later, uh, Osman Dias dreams of this pirate vessel, as explicitly we are having characters in thing reference this narrative which has a certain end. And then we have this next panel, I think, which notes something. Nothing ever ends, Adrian. Nothing ever ends. Now, that element of like, yes, the ending is there, therefore we are meant to extrapolate an ending. Uh, you know, and I've said a minute ago, the, the fate of the, of the world is in the hand of a least intellectually developed character. This is a big nihilistic statement. I mean, Alan Moore did the, you know, Watchmen came from a really bad mood. I was in the mid-80s. Uh, mm. Nihilism is fun, though. Um, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is Watchmen paints this deterministically clockwork universe. If you read it enough, you know the structure. You know what, why what happens and the reasons why everything comes together. If you read it enough, you get that. If the whole book says everything in is predetermined, and by the forces of put into motion mean this, to expect it to actually come to an ending as not know what happens next is against the structure of the clockwork machine. As the, the clock will carry on ticking. And if you read Watchmen enough, you know what the next tick is. It's more interest as an artistic challenge, I'll leave it hanging, but it's also a test, is my position. Watchmen wants you to pay attention. I mean, I was thinking about um, one of its major... When I say it wants you to pay attention, I mean, it's like if you read it enough and dig into it enough, it will try to teach you to make that leap yourself. And it's a book that wants to make you, make you have the leap. I was reading one of the most acclaimed chapters, Fearful Cemetery, when doing it. And it's kind of a tour de force. It's uh, famously the entire issue is mirrored in that the first page and the last page are kind of direct mirrors of each other. Can you bounce between those two a bit? Like you see the first panel on the top left and the bottom at the top right. And if you go for them all, the whole issue has that rough structure. Um, it's not always one for one, but it's, you know, it's an element of symmetry going on there. And then you get to the centerpiece image, which is this one, next page, and the next one, which is obviously incredibly showy. I must admit, when I reread it to do Watchmen in this speech, it kind of turned me off. I just thought it was a bit like um, virtuosic for, la for lack of effect. I thought it was a bit um, the element of classicism to it and all that. It was just showing I really genuinely didn't see the point of it. And then I thought maybe being that obvious is the point. The idea that you do something that this sits kind of roughly in the centre of the story, which is meant to be so obvious and so screaming for attention. The point being, you should start paying attention a bit more here. And when you see this... You can't miss the fact that the you say, oh, this is symmetry. So what else could be in symmetry? So you realize the rest of the issue is in symmetry. The entire point, this is like a louder note to make sure you understand there's a larger purpose. And then when you start actually attacking Watchmen with that line of thought, you, you, know, you discover much more. So it's always, this is basically a kind of like an entry point. This is, a, this is the lowest level entry point for your attention. And then you mentally dig into the rest. 
And then you get, you know, you get this chapter, you get to the, you realize how many symmetries in the story, not only the structural across the issue, you get the, you know, dead man and the shark, the dead shark, you know, you've got the man above and the dead shark below and all these kind of like those sort of imageries. And it basically is kind of priming you to be like Dr. Manhattan and kind of take apart the book and do what you want with it, you know, uh, and understand it rather than that, I think. As the comic book reader, and it's worth remembering there's a comic book reader in Watchmen, his, his basic final line, or at least full, uh, final statement of merit, I think, is this. Because they don't make sense, man. That's why i got to read them over. You know, that's that fundamentally what Watchmen is trying to say. There's a, that Gaiman quote that regularly comes up that he defines literature and versus just a story. In the, you know, a story can be read once for pleasure. Uh, literature, by definition, can be reread re for uh, increasing pleasure multiple times. Is the, that's kind of the approach. That's a very bad paraphrase. Sorry, Mr. Gaiman. And such, well, we're, you know, Watchmen's brutal structural attack is both an example of literature and encouragement of literature. Um, of course, the most powerful reader in the story is Ozymandias. He stares at a grid in front of him until it makes sense. Then he decides what it means and how he's going to change the world. Much like the readers of the comic. Much like the screens are like comic panels. Now, the first time I did this speech, I ended this section kind of just leaving it there as an idea that Ozymandias is reading a comic. And Ozymandias speaks about how he processes his reality uh, by watching all these screens at once and taking a larger meaning from one of the fragments. Yes? Um, and of course, I thought it was a bit of a reach. I was kind of hoping that people would like just go with me a bit, uh, especially on this panel. Uh, then my friend Cy Spurrier said he was really interested. He said, you know, the one thing about that panel is, you know how many uh, screens are up there? I mean, I was thinking about nine, of course, nine panel grid. No, there's 18. 18, of course, being the number of panels on a double page spread. So you basically have Ozzy Dyer sitting in front of a double page spread of like Watchmen panels. Ah, you see. Very well done. Right, very clever. We must watch this. Okay, this has mainly been technique stuff, trying to make that argument. I want to fanboy out a bit, if that's okay. I'm just going to talk about some stuff I really love in Watchmen. Uh, okay, transitions. Watchmen is basically based off transitions. Uh, this would be an example of this page. We basically go between, you know, ironic juxtaposition between image and uh, overload dialogue from another scene, the top one. Let's try to keep this snappy as they snap their arms. And, you know, I believe it's quite sudden and painful as he stabs them in the eye. <laughs> uh, whatever it is you super people do, and they're just grabbing him by the balls and punching him in the face. Uh, which is passably funny. I just think it's a bit, um, it's a bit crass. You know, that's in the kind of, this is one of Watchmen's major techniques. It's, it's telling that, uh, that more kind of abandon it quite regularly after this. However, it doesn't mean that it's copable to be incredibly beautiful when it works. For example, here. This is one of my favorite transitions in all of Watchmen. It's this at the end of a page. Uh, the kiss uh, between Silk Spectre I've, and Night Owl. My God, I almost called him Blue Beetle. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Silk Spectre, <laughs> See, they, you know, they're analogs, you know. Uh, <laughs> Silk Spectre <laughs> and Night Owl. From this to the Rorschach mask which of course leads to Rorschach's death scene. And this is beautiful for many reasons. It's because it's picking up a, an interesting transition between imagery in and of itself. It's also an imagery which pays off so much other imagery throughout the entire book. For example, we have here, the Hiroshima lovers when everyone's dead. In that we have the Hiroshima lovers on the wall, which is being talked about all the way from the book, essentially of haunting the streets. Uh, and in front of this image, we have all the, frankly, grotesquely pornographic image of all the lovers in the book collapsing together in death, which is very sad. And I mean pornography of violence, as in there's something really horrible about it. Uh, and it's unrelenting. Uh, if, the lovers in the dream sequence of Dryberg. Then we have uh, Rorschach's mum having sex and the things that haunted him. Picked up here. So you've got all these different ideas of what, what love and intimacy and fear and this means. And this comes together in this one tradition, which is uh, it, beautiful, beautiful. Sorry. Okay, uh, really minor. I mean, we, you know, we've always had this entire chapter especially around Dr. Manhattan's perception of time being outside the comic. But, he, they, you know, they don't, that doesn't really show it in the, in the comic. So they do, for example, this. So we have these transitions very early on where we have him considering things across time. So he would have experienced those two moments simultaneously. They show that visually by having Dr. Manhattan in the same pose, despite there being 20 years separating these two scenes. Uh, similarly, 
when we actually have him arriving with a tachyon field, which is disrupting his sense of time and not really understanding what the hell's going on. He's having conversation in two places at once. For example, over the page we have this. And we have him walking and doing the same thing across multiple panels. That's quite fancy, <laughs> uh, which I like a lot. Uh, the Gordian Knot is one of the recurring images. That's Ozymandias is desperate to cut the Gordian Knot. Uh, can we find a way out of history? Of course, all the way through we have the Gordian Knot Company, which was never explicitly referenced, but they're the ones who keep on fixing Dryberg's lock and which Rorschach keeps on breaking. <laughs> Uh, which, of course, for me, is also something else that points towards the fact that it's actually going to be Rorschach who breaks the Gordian knot of, of his structure, if you will. Here's, a, here's one, which... Uh, it, this is one of those kind of favourite Watchmen fanboy ones. I believe that... Uh, I believe it has been denied of being true. But, there's, you know, death of the artists and all that. Uh, in the first uh, issue, we have all these little, suit, little cubes. These are cubes which are stolen by Rorschach and put in his pocket. Uh, this leads to the penultimate episode when he is going across uh, the, winterness, the winter wilderness up and uh, in the Arctic Circle. He's traveling to an Arctic fortress of a, basically a soup of one of the highest powers on Earth. And we have uh, what appears to be a Superman cloak made out of the sugar cube. And now they have, of course, the Fortress of Solitude metaphor going on there. That's quite cute. I like that. Okay. I'm going to... I talked about Rorschach as tragic character arc, and I mean tragic in the larger literary definition. Rorschach's initial words, because there is good and because there is evil, and evil must be punished, even in the face of Armageddon, I shall not compromise in this. And that, you know, with that line, he assigned his death warrant. That's why, that's why Rorschach has to die, because this is what he will not change. Uh, kind of telling. His mask changes in every panel. The panel just warps, and every time you see Rorschach, his face warps. Except in this sequence where everybody else is choosing to compromise. We have Manhattan and Silk Spectre and Night Owl all realising that they have to compromise. There's no way through it. And this one sequence, Rorschach's face mask change stays exactly the same. While the rest of the world is changing, Rorschach's ever-changing mask is not, even when we get to the punchline. Rorschach is literally being the immovable force. What I also didn't put in the first speech and I entirely forgot about is this bit. It's exactly the same face mask as when he first says that line that dooms him. Oh, fuck me, I love this book. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this is my minor one for me. Uh, these two scenes of physical awkwardness aboard the owl ship. This is the first time he realises a flirtation between um, Dryberg and Laurie in the, kind of the, that, the overlong handshake. Later on you have a similar handshake between uh, Rorschach and Night Owl. I think that's an interesting subtext of the relationships going on here. This is another one that's been denied, but I still like it. Uh, it's the Hooded Justice and the Captain uh, both die. In fact, there's a suggestion that Hooded Justice is killed by the comedian that was never really confirmed in the text. Is that these two gentlemen look a lot like the two characters <laughs> and they have little face masks and it appears to be a, a quite happy gay couple who are living fine. So the idea that they faked their own deaths and didn't die and it ended up okay is in the text. To be honest, it's, it's kind of hard on support because the only reason you, you know that guy <laughs> is Hooded Justice is because the person whose body was found picture in the newspaper. So that kind of disappears of its own tail a little, uh, but I still like it. <laughs> Really a minor, it's a more minor stylistic note, is then you kind of think about the bombastic element of, if you've seen the movie version, uh, the whole, um, none of you understand, I'm not locked up in here with you, you're locked up here in me. That's one of those lines that people quote regularly from Watchmen, it's a hell of a line, and they quote unquote throw it away in a caption. I think most writers would have that as a, you know, you'd see Rorschach doing it, and they don't. This is, you know, they understate, they cut away, they understand they can make something powerful without having to do that, which is nice. I just want to read this bit. <laughs> Stood in firelight, sweltering bloodstains on chests like a map of violent new continent. Then cleansed, felt dark planet turn under my feet, and knew what cats know that make them scream like babes in the night. Looked at sky through smoke heavy with human fat, and God was not there. The cold suffocating dark goes on forever when we are alone. We live our lives lacking anything better to do. Devise reason later. Born from oblivion, their children hellbound as ourselves. Go into oblivion, there is nothing else. None more golf like that, <laughs> like that a lot. And this weirdly, I remember actually, just after reading Watchmen, 
I read Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, which of course talks about raising the axe. And the power of comics being you have an image and you have another image and you choose the, the power of closures inside your head. And I mean, I come back to this scene and that is a, that is a horribly brutal image of what actually happens to those dogs as in their butchering of those animals is, is, is as horrific on par with a book which features so many people dying, which is very powerful. There's one more thing. I've talked about the detailing here, you know, and I kind of want to talk about more. I kind of, you know, when I was going through this, I sort of wanted to pick out panels and tear it apart. If I sat down with a copy of Watchmen with you, I would just very happily like giggle like a child. And it's like the idea that it's overwhelming and I just couldn't work out how to take it apart. The interconnecting is just so overwhelming. However, at one point in the early noughties, one of my friends forwarded me this interview which has this quote from Alan Moore in. And when asked about this kind of like uh, detailing, it was the, the very first page of issue three when I realized we'd actually got more than we bargained for. I suddenly thought, hey, I'm gonna do something where we've got this radiation sign being screwed into a wall on the other side of the street, what underlines kind of nuclear threat. Grab this newspaper guy just ranting, the way people on street corners with a lot of spare time sometimes do. And I have a narrative from this pirate comic that the kid's reading. I have all them bouncing off each other. I get this really weird thing going on uh, where things that mention the pirate story will seem to relate to images in the panel, or what the newsman is saying. And that's when Watchmen took off. That's when I realized there was something more important going on than just the dog attacking the superhero, which after all I'd already done with Marvel Man. Now, what kind of blew my mind at this point is, in other words, kind of to a considerable degree, within the larger plan of the plot and everything, they made this up as they went along. But, you know, all this stuff, they just, did, they just made up on the fly. And that scared all the hell out of you. <laughs> if you're a writer, it doesn't seem possible. They would have to be superhuman to do that. That should be a cause of optimism. Uh, as good as uh, Moore and Gibbons are, they aren't superhuman. It's not as hard and unreachable or impossible as you may think. You only have to make the effort. I suppose the challenge of Watchmen is always to make comics better. It imagines a better world with better readers and better writers in it. As such, it's in our hands now. The universe being put to motion, which kind of makes us all Watchmen. Uh, thank you. <laughs>